Good morning, Sample Christian Fellowship. Uh, welcome to our online church experience. Uh, my name is Pastor Ken, and I am the Congregational Care Pastor here on staff, and it is my pleasure to welcome you uh, here with us today. Uh, I'm glad that you took uh, an hour of your weekend and you're joining us. Before we get started, uh, we just have a couple of announcements that we would like to share with you today. What an exciting couple of weeks uh, it has been for our church family. There's lots going on uh, here around the building, but there's lots going on in our families as well. And this morning we want to just congratulate a few of our families that have had special family moments over the past couple of weeks. And so we are saying congratulations this morning to Mitchell and Meg Tobin, uh, who welcomed their daughter Ainsley Grace Tobin. Uh, she was born seven pounds, 11 ounces on July 2nd. And we are so excited for you guys uh, and the new addition to your family. Congratulations. We also want to welcome to the church family, Elijah Gabriel Hogenberg. He was born on July 3rd and weighed eight pounds. Congratulations, Peter and Caitlin and the rest of the Hogenberg family. And a special congratulations to Brian Palmer and Kara Barwell, uh, who are now officially uh, Mr. and Mrs. Brian and Kara Palmer. Uh, you guys had your wedding yesterday and just from our church family, congratulations to you. We wish you God's best as you begin your new life together. As you join us each week uh, for our online church experience, uh, we are trying our best to continue to make that the best experience that you can have. And so uh, you'll notice that there's changes that happen. There's no longer a pre-service. There's no longer the lobby after service. And that's simply because we want you to visit with those around you and have some fellowship time before and after the service with those that you are watching with in your watch party. If you're a part of a watch party, please let us know by going to sobelchurch.ca slash watch party. There, it'll just take 15 seconds to fill out a survey, and there's also guidelines to keep your watch party safe. Whether you're watching the service at 10 a.m. or 8 p.m., whether you're watching it even on YouTube or Facebook, we highly recommend watching it on the online church platform. Just go to sobelchristianfellowship.online.church. There, you can watch the service and chat along with everyone else watching. There are also some very helpful features like giving, live prayer, and even a Bible you can follow along with. We highly, highly recommend this service. That's all for announcements this week. We'll be back in a couple minutes, so take this time to talk to the people around you. And if there isn't anyone around you, just send someone the fist bump emoji and let them know you're thinking about them. You could also fill your coffee, grab some food, do whatever you want. We'll be back in a couple of minutes.
as we come to worship this morning, uh, we are looking forward to uh, being joined by, with Pastor Dave again this morning as he continues in this series on Know God, Become Like Jesus, and Change Our World. And I hope that uh, you have a big picture of God in your mind and God's heart for you, uh, which results in uh, you becoming more like Jesus. But as we have a big picture of God in our minds, that should cause us to want to worship, to want to lift up our hands and to sing and to praise the Lord. I'm reading from Psalm uh, chapter 104. It says, May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. He looks on the earth and it trembles. He touches the mountains and they smoke. This is a big God that we serve. And here's the response. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have being. May my meditation be pleasing to him, for I rejoice in the Lord. I hope that that's your at heart attitude as we come to worship today. Let's just pray uh, before we uh, join together. God, we thank you that you are a big God. God, we thank you that uh, even though you are a big God, you love us uh, unconditionally. You love us individually. You know us individually. You're not so big and so and distant that we can't know you, but God, you desire for each and every one of us to have a personal relationship with you. And we can know you and we can become like you because that's what you've called us to be. And uh, so God, as we join in worship today, God, uh, just as the psalmist here says, God, may our meditation be pleasing to you and may you be glorified. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. You are the one that rescues me. 
Ever wondered what God looks like? I know I have. I know as far back as I can remember, I've wondered. But I've never been satisfied with where it got me. I've thought of God as an old man, a nice grandfather figure, but one who's a tad fragile, not someone who can defend me when I'm threatened. I've feared him as a strict principal, an ever-present policeman who was always nagging on me and just waiting to thumb me as the guy who did it. I once considered him to be my good luck charm. All I had to do was call on him and hopefully he would come serve me and give me what I want, my own personal genie in a bottle. I even pictured him as an absent landlord, someone I have to pay rent to, and frankly, probably someone who has a lot better things to do than bother with me. And I've imagined him other ways, but all my images of God are just too small. All of them, that is, except one. God has told us in the Bible that He is spirit. It does not detail His physical appearance, and in fact, it reminds us that no man has seen God at any time. But the Bible also tells us something else. It tells us that God became flesh. It tells us that Jesus makes it known what God is like, that He is the visible image of the invisible God, that in Jesus, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. It tells us that Jesus Himself said, He who has seen me has seen the Father. If you know me, you know my Father. The Bible also says that Jesus' body was not stately in form or appearance that we should be attracted to Him, but His person, wow, talk about attractive. When you talk about the person of Jesus, you don't find yourself talking about His strong points. You marvel that He is the exact representation of the nature of God. Every good attribute and characteristic of perfection was seen in Jesus. Want to know what God looks like? Then take a look at Jesus. See how he handles the oppressed. Watch how Jesus pursues those that are lost. Notice how he deals tenderly with friends. Be amazed at how he loves and offers forgiveness to his enemies. Look at how he stands strong in the face of death. Notice how he sacrifices himself for the good of others. Watch how he respects those in authority and yet how he bows to no one. Observe how he handles hypocrites, betrayal, and deceit. Look at his response to dead religion, burdensome traditions, and the arrogance of men. And yet, notice how children run to him. Watch him serve his world and lead his men. Always loving, never failing, continually forgiving. Want to know what God looks like? Look at Jesus. Hi folks, I'm glad you're joining us. Whether you're alone or in a watch party, whether you're watching on Sunday morning or in the middle of the night, I'm glad you tuned in. If you were with us last week, we talked about knowing God and, and, and the pursuit of God, of knowing Him more, falling in love with Him, making knowing Him the chief business of our lives. I think we can see God I think we can see his love, his mercy, or his forgiveness. We see something of God on every page of the Bible. If you're reading through the Bible with us this year, one of the things I asked you to do was to listen to the Bible Recap podcast every day after you read. If you're doing that, then you're hearing her point out what she calls her God shot every day. In other words, where she points out how she sees God and who he is every single day. Get good at that skill. Whenever you read the Bible, no matter what section, we should be able to see God's character shining through. Get good at recognizing that. The truth is, the easiest way to see that, it's in the Gospels, because Jesus is the perfect picture of God. Remember that from last Sunday? Jesus is the perfect reflection, the exact image or picture of God. All of who God is, is in Jesus. That's why I love that video and I wanted to start with it today. So get this, Jesus is the perfect image of God. You see that. Humans were created in the image of God. You know that. What God wants is to restore you to that created image to restore in you what we see in Jesus. Jesus, who is fully human, living on earth as the image of God. That's the work God wants to do in you. And it'll be complete when you're with him in eternity. Until then, it's his work in you as you pursue him like we talked about last week. That process starts with knowing God. 
as we know him more, as our relationship deepens, as we fall more and more in love with him, it will drive us further towards him and draws us near to him. And guess what happens? We change. What we call discipleship grows out of knowing God. Christian character, maturity, transformation of our behavior, our godliness, our Christ-likeness, it all comes out of knowing God more. I want us to really know God more and more every day, and through that, to allow Him to transform us into the image of His Son, Jesus. Last week we watched an old sermon. Today we're going to continue that series from a few years ago. And everything today builds and flows out of knowing God. Keep that in mind as we work through this today. So let's join that message, and I'll come wrap it up at the, at the end. To know God more and more, and let Him restore us. Let Him begin to change us into His image, to become like Jesus. Romans chapter 8. There's a bunch of places we're going to go over the course of the morning. Romans chapter 8, in verse 29, says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. You were predestined to become like Jesus. Have you ever thought of it that way? What is your destiny? And if your destiny was predetermined by God, it is simple. It is for you to become like Jesus. To be conformed, to be shaped and changed and grown into your destiny. You see, in Genesis chapter 1, way at the very, very beginning, as God is creating the world and all of the things in it, he comes to verse 26 of chapter 1 and says, God said, let us make human beings in our image and likeness. God's original creation, the humans, was like him. The image, the picture of God. That was his creation as humans in the beginning. God's plan was to make you like him. This is your intent. Your original intended destiny. Now that likeness, that image, that picture became incomplete. Damaged, broken, stained and distorted because of sin. So human nature was contaminated beyond recognition and needed to be redeemed. So Jesus then, God sent Jesus on a rescue mission to restore the full image of God. And last week we looked at two things. That Jesus came to correct the view of God into a world that misunderstood, that was misguided, that did not get the picture of God correct. That Jesus came to correct that picture. But Jesus came also to restore what was broken and incomplete and damaged and distorted by sin. Did you know Ephesians chapter 4 verse 24 says you were created to be like God. Truly righteous and holy. That's character. You were created to be, predestined to be, in his image. The picture of God on earth. Now let me make this absolutely clear. You cannot become God. You are not a God. And that, that prideful lie is Satan's oldest temptation. And Satan promised Adam and Eve in the garden that if they followed his advice, you will be like God. Big difference in that subtle twist of language he uses there. Because Satan tells Adam, if you do this, you'll know right and wrong, you will be just like God. Twisting his language, God doesn't want you to become God. God doesn't want you to become a God. God wants you to be godly. You see the difference? To restore back to his values, his attitudes, his character, his heart, his mission. That is very simply his plan for his people and his church. We are meant to take on an entirely different way of life. His way. His life. 
Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22 says, Put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupted. He's saying, this is a God-fashioned life. A life renewed from the inside and working itself into your conduct as God accurately reproduces his character in you. That's what Paul is saying. And over and over and over, this same message comes out in the New Testament. This is, is, is actually one of the dominant teachings, one of the dominant doctrines of the entire New Testament. To become like Jesus. Matthew chapter 5, verse 48 as I studied this week and I found that verse, I, I want to come back to that in a second, but I want to read it to you from the message. The message uh, I keep open often because as I'm studying, it always gives me a different perspective. And I like to go back and check and see, are, is it right, is it not right, all those, I like that part of the process. But this is what it says, Matthew 5 verse 48 in the message, it says, in a word, what I'm saying is, grow up. You are kingdom subjects. Now live like it. Live out your God-created identity. Live generously and graciously towards others the way God lives towards you. Now, if you've already turned there in Matthew 5, chapter verse 48, our other translations of the Bible are not quite that long and involved. It's very simple. It says, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Well, there's a big difference between It doesn't sound like the same verse at all. Matthew 5 is Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And he starts with the Beatitudes, the attitudes that we should take in our posture. He gets into being salt and light and deals with anger and lust and relationships. Love your enemies and do not retaliate. This beautiful, deep, rich talk about life and character. And he comes to the end of that and then said, okay, so just be perfect. So here's what I found. And for those of you who like the word smithing and all those kind of things. The word perfect in that verse is the Greek word teleos. And that word literally means complete in application. It means growth in moral character and mental ability. In, in regards to a man or woman, it means full of age. So mature, complete, lacking nothing, wanting nothing, full grown, a mature adult. So why does that come out in English as the word perfect? It's interesting because we have that same Greek word is translated two very different ways all the way through the New Testament. In 1 John chapter 4, that same Greek word is used in the sentence, perfect love casts out fear. All right? So when you, you translate that it, it, into the meaning of that word, mature, complete, lacking nothing, full-grown love casts out fear. Well, that makes perfect sense, right? In Romans chapter 12, Verses 1 and 2, where we're instructed to be a living sacrifice with a transformed mind, discerning God's will. It says God's good, acceptable, and perfect will. That same word. But in chapter 5 of Hebrews, we have that same word, and it's the sentence, solid food is for the mature. Can we flip it and say solid food is for the perfect? That, it, it doesn't seem to work in my mind. I get confused with this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, it says, Don't be children in your thinking, but in your thinking be mature. The same word. So as I studied this, I kind of started going in circles this week. Because how could the Bible translators, in this verse call it perfect, in the next verse call it mature, and, and how do they decide which is which? I got really confused. So here's what I did. I went to the English Dictionary. The word perfect, this is the definition. Having all the required and desirable elements, qualities, or characteristics, as good as it can be. 
having all the required or desired elements or qualities or characteristics. So let's put that into that verse in, in, in verse 48 of chapter 5. Be perfect as your father is perfect. So it's basically saying, if we go by the English dictionary, have all the required and desirable elements, qualities, and characteristics of your father. Ah, I like that. I like that. In the contemporary English version, that same verse just simply says, but you must always act like your father in heaven. I don't usually bounce around in scripture as much as I am today. But I hope that you see this idea of becoming like Jesus is central to God's word. From the beginning of Genesis on almost every page of the New Testament. If I was to give you a, a, a really a gross summary of the New Testament, here's what it is. People were confused and misguided with their understanding of God. And so Jesus came, God himself, as a living, full-color picture of everything God is. Jesus himself restores us back to the way we were created, in his likeness, in his image. You want to know what God looks like? You look at Jesus. You want to know what Jesus looks like? Look at his people. This is his dream for you. Complete, mature, growing, with all the qualities and characteristics of the Father. He says... Be an adult. Grow up. Be mature. In its simplicity. You want to know what God is like? Look at Jesus. You want to know what Jesus is like? Look at his people. So go to Colossians chapter 1 now, if you have your Bible there. Colossians chapter 1. And in, in here, um, in the beginning of Colossians, actually all of Colossians, Paul is talking about this exact same thing. And he comes to verse 26. <clears throat> and I think what he's saying is exactly what I'm feeling. That I cannot be successful in becoming like Jesus. I cannot work at it. I can't emulate him. I can't change my character. To a certain degree, I can refine and practice and grow. But there's something missing, and there's only one way to succeed spiritually. In knowing God and becoming like Jesus and changing our world, there's only one way to succeed. And we see in verse 26, 27, that it's a mystery. And that mystery has been hidden for the ages, for generations. But now it's revealed. The mystery has been revealed. And this is it. The entire deal. Becoming Christ-like. Becoming like Jesus. Knowing God. Changing our world. Are you ready? What's the mystery? The mystery which is Christ in you. Christ in you. The hope of glory. Him we proclaim. Warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that, why? That we may present everyone mature. Oh, there's that same word. Perfect in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy, that he powerfully works within me. It's not I'm toiling with every ounce of energy I've got. Because Christ is in me. It's his energy, energy. It's his working through me. And so I toil. So what does this actually look like? When Christ takes residence in me. What does this look like? Well, Ephesians chapter 4, we've already looked at. It says, grow up in every way to be like Jesus. Galatians chapter 5, Paul is talking about the same thing. And in chapter 5, he says, uh, those who belong to Christ, who are led by the Spirit, will demonstrate love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. All characteristics. 
Philippians chapter 2, we read before, we looked at the list of characteristics of Jesus. Colossians, Ephesians, 1 Thessalonians, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus. All of these books are the same content. Be like Jesus. And the book of John is one of my favorites. Verse after verse after verse, painting a beautiful picture of who Jesus is. And in my own study, I have over 300 characteristics attitudes or behaviors of Jesus from the book of John that God wants desperately to bring out in us to be a picture of Jesus. God's ultimate goal for your life on earth is not comfort, happiness, health, or fellowship. He wants you to grow up spiritually and become like Jesus more and more and more every day until the day I die. And that day, then I will be with him and the work he began in me will be complete. What would it look like for your Bible study or your daily devotions, time alone with God or your life group or a class you're in to not be driven by chapters in the Bible or book sections or curriculum? What if it was just simply driven by my life transformation in becoming more like Jesus? That as I learn more about God, as I walk with him and talk with him, as I study to focus my attention and my thoughts on becoming more like him, I think we'd see way more character growth. I think we'd see a lot more life change, transformations of attitudes, of passions, of desires, of pursuits, of the way I use my time, in generosity, in purpose, and in mission. So Paul says, forget what's behind. Press forward on what's ahead. That every single day could be better than it was yesterday in my walk with God. That every day I am more like Jesus. Every day I know God more. My best days then are always ahead of me. It doesn't matter how old or how young I am. Tomorrow is better than today. Because I'm working towards my destiny. What he has predestined in me is coming to life because he is living in me and he's conforming me into his image. There's an old, old song I remember from when I was a kid. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Do you know that one? Every day with Jesus, I love him more and more. Jesus saves and keeps me and he's the one I'm waiting for. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Is tomorrow your best day ever? This is your quest. If you are a follower of Jesus, this is your quest. This is your destiny. This is what you were predestined to be. To know him, to become like Jesus. And our world will change. What would it look like to our community? If we were all on this quest to pursue our destiny of becoming like Jesus, with Jesus taking residence in us, changing us, transforming us, conforming us into his image, what would that look like to the world outside? In New York City, several years ago in a downtown mission, a man named Joe, who was a drunk, uh, found Jesus at this mission. And Joe had a reputation as the dirtiest, filthiest man, with no hope, absolutely miserable. And when Joe met Jesus at this mission, everything changed. Very quickly, day and night, Joe became the most caring person that was ever connected to that mission. Whatever was needed, nothing was beneath him. He cleaned up the vomit left by violently sick alcoholics. He scrubbed the toilets after the careless men. He did everything with a soft smile and with gratitude. He cared for the feeble men, often getting them into bed when they were not capable themselves. 
And one evening at an evangelistic meeting, as the preacher spoke, a man came to the front of the altar crying out to God to change him. And as he cried out to God, he said, Oh God, make me like Joe. Make me like Joe. Make me like Joe. And the preacher, of course, then said, Oh, don't you mean make me like Jesus? And he looked at him and says, Is he like Joe? (laughs) Imagine what it would look like. Imagine what God could do through a church full of people that are driven to become like Jesus. We're in process to become a clearer and clearer, full-color, living picture of Jesus. The way Jesus is a full-color, living picture of God. We are that to our world, to the people outside of these doors. That is his church. Pray with me. Jesus, as I said, I was startled this week as I studied and found this on every single page. That this is your dream for us from before creation. That you would make us in your image the picture of who you are. That God, Jesus, has done everything necessary to correct our view of you and to restore that which was broken so that we can know you, that we can walk into your presence. God, would you transform our lives? Would we be open To not just invite Jesus to be our Savior, but invite Jesus to invade, to take residence, to possess us by His Spirit. And then to do that work in us to make us more and more and more like Jesus. That is our destiny as people. Whether people believe you or not, Whether they hate you or not, that is our destiny, is to know you and become like Jesus. So God, would you do that work in us? May we become a better and better and fuller, more beautiful picture every day of who you are. And shine that brightly to the world around us. God, would you do your work that we might be the church. In Jesus' name, amen. Quoting from the video we watched a half an hour ago, see how Jesus handles the oppressed. Watch how Jesus pursues those who are lost. Notice how he deals tenderly with friends and be amazed at how he offers love and forgiveness to his enemies. Look at how he stands strong in the face of death. Notice how he sacrifices himself for the good of others. Watch how he respects those who are in authority, yet he bows to no one. Observe how he boldly handles hypocrites and deceit, and look at his strong response to dead religion, burdensome traditions, and the arrogance of man. And yet, notice how children run to him. Watch him serve his world and lead his men, always loving, never failing, continually forgiving. I want you to see that these things we see in Jesus are God's character. And these same things are God's heart and desire for you. He wants more than anything that the created in his image be fully restored in you. I hope you can hear me say that here. I want you to see that when God asks that we be characterized by love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, And when he asks us to be truthful and generous and merciful, he's not just laying out expectations, knowing you're going to blow it. I am your God. Do this or else. No. These are his characteristics. They're his image. 
the way he created you and he wants to fix, to restore, to build in you what's been lost and broken. Do you see his heart? I hope that you can see that become like Jesus doesn't happen unless step one is happening. Know God more and more and he changes us. And as we know him more and more, we're compelled to him. Our relationship deepens and broadens and his change is alive in us because he takes up residence in us. The more we really know him, the more he makes us like him. The change in me, discipleship, Christian growth, the teleos, maturity, all come as a result of knowing him more and more. It's our quest. Knowing God is the chief business of our lives. This is discipleship. This is the quest. Know God, become like Jesus, and your world will change all as you know him more and more. Let me remind you that the reason God created people in the first place, you for a matter of fact, is to know him and enjoy him. Let's really pursue or go after knowing him in depth, in breadth, in relationship more and more and more every day, every day of our lives. <clears throat> and as we do that, focus on allowing him to make those changes in us, bringing about a restoration of you Knowing God is the chief business of our lives, changing us, transforming us, restoring us into his image on earth. Let me pray. Father, have your way in us. That's easy to say and hard to live. So show us who you are. Compel us towards you as we see your love, your mercy, your forgiveness, your justice, your faithfulness, and how you are actually pursuing us. Open our eyes to see you. Open our eyes to see Jesus. Draw us into your care, take up residence in us, and do your work. Have your way in us. Amen. We believe.
sins and my sorrows and made them as very old. He bore the burden to carry and suffered and died alone. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall end. As we close today, allow me to leave you with this benediction from Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 to 11. We ask God to give you complete knowledge of His will and to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. Know God. Then the way you live will always honor and please the Lord. Become like Jesus. And your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. Change our world. All the while, you will grow as you learn to know God better and better. Knowing God is key all the way through. We also pray that you will be strengthened with all his glorious power, so you will have all the endurance and patience you need. May you be filled with joy, because he is where the joy is. God bless you. Thank you for being here with us, and we'll see you right here again next week, uh, online.sobblechurch.ca.